The following is a presentation of Seaside Community Baptist Church. In Budapest, it seems one man, he went to meet a rabbi and he began to complain and he said, Rabbi, my life is unbearable. There are nine of us living in one room. What can I do? The rabbi answers and says, take your goat into the room with you. The man said, that is ridiculous. But the rabbi says, do as I say, take the goat into your room and come back in a week and tell me how life is. A week later, this man comes back, he's even more distraught, and he said, we cannot stand it. The goat is filthy and it stinks, sir. And we can't have the goat in our room. Nine of us plus the goat is not an easy thing. Then the rabbi tells him, go home and let the goat out and come back in a week. So this man comes back after a week, he's all radiant, and he's excited and says, rabbi, our life is beautiful. We enjoy every minute of it. Now there is no goat. It's only nine of us in the room. You know, if you want to know what Thanksgiving is, yes, we got to think about what it could have been, and we will be very thankful. But truly this morning, can we think, we as a society and a culture in North America, are we really thankful people? Are we really thankful people? Is there thanksgiving in our hearts that is obvious? Most of the things I see is that we are not content with what we are, who we are, or where we are. We are always looking for something better, something new, a better salary, or even a better boss, and eventually one day a better pastor, right? We are not content with what we got. We always want something new. The Boxing Day sale or something new comes up, you see the commotion that goes on at Walmart. People want something better all the time, and that's our mentality. Quakers, these were religious sect of people, simple people who lived earlier, and they had a saying, it says, they said, tell me what you need, and I'll tell you how to get along without it. That's a Quaker statement. Tell me what you need, I'll tell you how to get along without it. Another man of God said this, he said, are we buying the things that we don't need with the money that we don't have to impress people that we don't even like? Are we buying the things that we don't need with the money that we don't have to impress people that we don't even like? My friends, we are in a want. We are a wanting people. We are never content. In the last days, we will be seekers of pleasure and that's what we need to be very careful against. These are the dangerous times that we are living in. Christ promised that he takes care of all our needs. He didn't say he'll take care of all our wants. There is a difference between a need and a want. And Bible says this in Matthew chapter 6, 31 to 34. Christ said this, therefore do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For all, after all these things, the Gentiles seek. We believers don't seek, the Gentiles, unbelievers seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. He also adds, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all his righteousness, and all the things shall be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. If you are living in a situation right now where you are not assured, is God really going to take care of my needs? If you don't have this assurance this morning, I want to take you through this simple psalm, Psalm 23, that the girl just quoted, the beautiful little girl. And it's so simple, but it's so deep, and that's what we're going to tackle this morning. Psalm 23, in this psalm, not a single need that we face is left out. We might be going through hardship, distressing times, inadequacies, uh, and uh, probably you, f you feel that God has uh, abandoned you. If that's, the t if that's the situation that you're sitting in here this morning, this psalm is for you. But on the other hand, 
if we are not depending on God enough, but are depending on our own abilities and are self-sufficient, this psalm is an attack in our lives. This psalm really rebukes us and questions us whether we actually trust in God as our shepherd. So the two sides for this story, either there are people who worry about how their tomorrow is going to be, or there are people who are self-sufficient and they don't depend on God at all. In either case, we undermine the sovereignty of God and what he's capable of doing in our lives. This psalm starts off by saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. As soon as we think about a sheep, about sheep and shepherd, the first thing it come, that comes to mind is this nice rolling hills in Scotland somewhere, or in New Zealand with this sheep so fluffy and beautiful. This is the picture that we have. But this is not the scenario on which this psalm is based out of. We need to go into the biblical context and experience what a shepherd was like in those days. And this is the terrain, my friends. Judean hills, Judean wilderness, that the shepherd lived and existed. You don't see rolling hills. In fact, you see rough, stony places, and a Palestinian shepherd is constantly looking for some pastures which are seasonal. They're constantly on the move. These shepherds are weather-beaten, and they have a leather-like skin appearance, and they were rugged people. They were constantly on the watch out, on the lookout for the sheep. For if a moment the shepherd took his eyes away, the, sheeps are in terrible, uh, the sheep are in terrible danger. Not only the terrain is dangerous, there are wolves, bears, and lions, and during the biblical times, they were thieves and robbers. So it was a dangerous job to be a shepherd during those days, and nothing much has uh, changed. Even the Bedouins or the uh, tribal people, the Middle Eastern shepherds, they still have the same patterns of taking care of the sheep. So the essential point in order to understand that the Lord is our shepherd, is we need to understand the context in this Judean wilderness in the land of Israel. So the first thing, if the Lord is our shepherd, we become what? Sheep. All the sheep say? Good, thank you. Well, seaside can have some fun sometimes, rarely. Don't act too religious, that's okay too. Have some fun, okay? If God is our sheep, we are? Uh, if God is our shepherd, we are? Sheep. sheep. And see, already I'm proving myself that I'm sheep. Sheep are not cool. Sheep are not cool. See that picture? They try to act cool, but they're not. <laughs> A man of God said, sheep are dumb, defenseless, and dirty. That's so true because they don't know what they're doing in the first place. Number two, they're defenseless because you don't use sheep for your security purposes. Do you? No, we don't. And they are dirty. They don't know how to take a bath. Somebody else has to deal with their stink. So they are not cool. So once we say the Lord is our shepherd, we admit that we are sheep and we are not cool. Period. We are sheep. So it takes humility to admit that we are nobodies, okay? That's the starting precursor. So once we admit that we are sheep, the Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. What shall you not want? What does it mean? It's saying, I shall not have any lack in my life. If the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not have any lack in my life. How does this play a role in our life? So if we read the rest of the Psalm, we'll understand how this shepherd provides for the needs of the sheep. Are you ready to go through this journey with me? It's a wonderful picture. The first thing is, the Bible says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters and he restores my soul. Probably this morning you're feeling spiritually drained and depleted. You're waiting patiently for the Lord to answer your prayer and nothing is happening as if somebody put a hold on a sales call, you know. It takes forever, and there's music going constantly, and you don't know what's, what God is up to. Or it's one of those lights in the traffic lights that do doesn't change quickly. There's one light I know in Halifax. I hate stopping at that light. It takes forever. The pastor has a lot of patience. Don't mistake me, okay? 
That light I don't like though. All right? So God here, he says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters and restores my soul. We might be going through wilderness in our life where we need to be restored. There's discouragement, disgust, defeat, wrestling, failure, futility, emptiness, agony, anger, agitation, all these positive words that are very dominant in our life at this very moment. And you sit here and say, oh, another sermon Sunday morning, another prayer meeting. But Bible says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. My friends, if we follow this shepherd, he makes us, he doesn't ask us. When we are restless and we're going through these tough times, he makes us lie down in green pastures. If we are self-sufficient and we feel no matter what, I'll try to solve my own problems and fix my own problems, we will not lie down. So the shepherd has to force us down. A place where there's total abandonment. It's like you're slammed against the wall and you could do nothing. Praise God, that's a good phase to be in. If you're going through those phases, it's an important thing. For a sh- have you ever seen sheep lying down? It's a very rare occurrence, my friends. Sheep never lay down until they're, they are satisfied in three things. Number one, they should be free from all fear in general. Unless they are free from all fear, they're not going to lie down. They're panicking. So in our lives, if we keep panicking, we'll never lie down. Until God slams us down on our face as a shepherd and makes us lie down in our green pastures, we uh, we won't do it because we're afraid of the circumstances. They're defenseless, as we said. One little rabbit can scare a whole flock. That's why there are only two sheepdogs that can, two or three that can take care of a whole flock of them. They're defenseless. That's why churches need to watch out for the wolves in sheep's clothing. There won't be 10 of them. It will only take one or two to split an entire church because we are sheep. We cannot defend ourselves. The fear needs to go away, free from all friction. If there's one sheep that acts up in the whole flock, the rest of them follow. They don't even ask why. If one sheep jumps off a cliff, it happened in Turkey. Hundreds of them Uh, jumped off the cliff, and they all died except for the ones on the top because they were cushioned by the ones that died below. (laughs) That's the way they are. Sheep, remember, we are sheep, all right? They need to be free from all friction. They need to free, and they need to be free from all the bugs and the pests in their life. Only then, and only then, they can lie down. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters, and he restores my soul. The first thing is that the Lord meets our spiritual needs. He doesn't make us lie down in any pasture, in a rocky, barren area. He makes sure that he'll be lie down in the green pastures, not beside raging waters, but beside still waters. In his presence is the fullness of joy. In his spare presence there is peace. He will restore us. You know, my friends, many people feel that people go from church to church because they don't like what's going on. Yeah, that's one factor. But one of the reasons why people wander away from a church, you know why? Because they are not fed, period. If there are no green pastures provided, they will wander away, period. You can't blame the sheep. If they are malnourished, they'll keep going, looking for other pastures somewhere. That's why it's very important for us to be taught and to stick to the word of God, to be nourished by our good shepherd. That's very, very important. And then, why does he do it? Why does he make us lie down in green pastures? The only reason why he does it is to restore our identity, our sense of purpose, to give us direction in our life so that we can be ready for the journey that is ahead of us. If we want to do things for God, if we want to be successful in life, spiritually speaking, if we want to be a blessing for others, you cannot be a blessing, you cannot be of a, of a great use for the Lord unless you understand what it is to lie down with the help of the Lord and to wait upon him to be restored completely. Without restoration, you cannot be effective for the kingdom of God, period. 
So first thing the Lord does, he restores our soul so that we can continue our journey. The first thing we need to know that God will try to show it again and again that he is God. He will be saying, be still, sheep, and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm God. And once you know that he is God, you will walk the rest of the journey anyway. It will be easy. The next thing it says, he leads me on the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The first thing he takes care of is our, our spiritual needs. The next thing he takes care of is our directional needs. Our life is full of choices, decisions, and opinions. I've spent a lot of time, I hate going to the grocery store. If I need to buy a shampoo, it takes me 15 minutes. The options are too many. Everything looks better than the previous one. Life is full of choices right from the grocery store to major decisions in life. We need direction. Sheep tend to veer off the path because they find better berries on the other side. They think they can make their decisions on their own, and they tend to gravitate towards trouble. The more we panic, the further we wander away from the path that God God has prepared, prepared for us. We are so dependent upon the circumstances when we think, okay, uh, this path seems right, so let's continue in this. But Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it's death. You might think, okay, this is the way we need to go. You know what's happening? We are basing our decisions based on circumstances. God doesn't want you to do that. He wants you to follow his voice as a shepherd and go behind the shepherd. We don't go by circumstances and just, oh, things are in place right now, so based on my circumstances, I think this is, the way, this is what I should be doing. Wrong. We don't act based on circumstances. Circumstances only confirm the Lord's leading. If we truly listen to the voice of the Lord, we will know truly what we need to be doing. For example, if God says, come on, He got a speaking engagement, one in Florida, Orlando, next to the Disneyland, and one in the valley, uh, Kentville. Small church, 20 people. What do I prefer to do? Same day, same time. I love to go to Florida. Never seen there, Disneyland, family. Oh, man, all those things play a role. And I'd say, certainly the Lord wants me to go to Florida, doesn't he? The Lord says, no. Kentville, that small church, where it'll be hard for you to find it in the first place, but that's where I want you to go. Based on my circumstances, if I make my decisions, I'll be disobeying God, I'll be making my own way. But if I listen to the voice of the shepherd, I'll be effective in Kentville in the, among those 20 people. That's where the Lord wants me to be, and I'll do it, and I'll have the peace about it. Circumstances do not dictate how we walk with the Lord. Circumstances only confirm. So how does the Lord speak to us? How does this shepherd communicate with us? Through his word and through prayer. When we depend and do the basics, church, many times I feel the people say, I'm struggling, I'm doing this, I I don't know where God is. Do the basics. Study the word and pray. Fellowship with other believers. Things will happen. When CSI started, I got a phone call from a church, in, from, a, from an organization in Ontario, and they said, what are you doing that this church is doing well? Sir, I'm not doing anything different. I'm doing the basics, pray, preach, fellowship. That's it. If you want to walk strong with the Lord, do the basics every day of your life, and you will see the fruit. That's walking. And Bible promises that he leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Paths of righteousness. If the shepherd leads us, he'll lead us in the right paths and the good paths, period. Probably you've seen this picture many times, a shepherd with the sheep on the shoulders. You know what this picture is about? If there's one in the flock, one, probably one sheep in the flock, that is crazy and wants to do its own thing. You know what the shepherd does? He hurts its leg so that it doesn't wander away. And after he hurts it, He carries it on his shoulders or in a little pouch for a while until the leg heals. And once the leg heals, if he puts it down, it's never going to leave the side of the shepherd. Isn't that strange? 
Sometimes if we wander away and want to do our own thing, God might chastise us. He chastises whom he loves. And when he chastises us, we'll never leave his side. Because he'll be there to make sure that you recover. My friends, there's a way that seems right to a man, but be careful. It may not be, the God's, it may not be God's way. We need to trust in our shepherd for his direction. So why does he lead in the paths of righteousness? This is my favorite statement. For his name's sake. If the sheep are doing well, who gets the glory? The shepherd will get the glory. If we walk in the paths of righteousness, who gets the credit? Christ himself will get the credit. It is for his name's sake that he'll lead us in the paths of righteousness. So meets number two, directional needs. Number three, this is what it says. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The Lord will take care of your emotional needs. Not only the spiritual needs, not only the directional needs, he'll also take care of your emotional needs. Valleys are not good places. These are the places that are associated with fear. We have so many negative feelings sometimes when things are not working. Everything is dark around us. There's uncertainty, frustration, discouragement. You feel lonely. There is hopelessness that kicks in and there's, we are helpless and we feel worthless. But mark those words very carefully. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it's only a shadow, it's not death. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it feels like death, it tastes like death, but it's not death. It's only a shadow. Even though we walk through these situations, God is with us. Sometimes these sheep, they're walking through this Judean wilderness with the shepherd. All of a sudden they're walking through the valley and it becomes dark. It's dark and the sheep are panicking. It's nighttime already, sheep, neighbor, sheep, be, right? What do we do? The foxes, hyenas, wolves waiting to devour us. It's dark, it's confusing. Why did this shepherd who started in, a, in the righteous paths lead us into the valley all of a sudden? What kind of journey is this? Doesn't make sense, does it? You're taking those pills every night and they don't seem to be working. Panic. You're trying to solve a problem for years, it's not happening. Emotions are running high. Every medicine you try fails. The jobs you've been trying, they're failing too. Health is failing, everything is happening, and you're getting tired of this darkness because you don't know what's happening. Why does this good shepherd lead us through these dark valleys? Simple reason. So that you can focus on him and him alone. You know why? You can see the goodness of your shepherd when you walk with him. When he is all you have, we will recognize that he is all we need. When he is all we have, we will recognize that he is all we need. When we go through these struggles in life and try to solve the problems on our own abilities, we will fail. But when the Lord reveals himself to us through these tough times, you will realize and I will realize that, yes, Lord, you're the only one I need who can solve this problem. Don't go to the problems again and again. Go to the source who can solve these problems. And the only way we can understand that God is caring and loving for us is that he is with us. King David says, I will fear no evil. Why? Because he is with me. When a little child gets scared of a thunderstorm, he's sleeping in his bed one night and when there's a crackling and a loud slap of thunder, he runs to his parents and he quickly hugs them. And you know what happens? He's at peace. Did the thunderstorm stop as soon as he ran to the parents? No, it didn't. The th thunderstorm is still going on, but how he's facing it has changed. The moment we know our God and run to him and know whom we can trust, whom we believe, when we know that, how we face the situations in life changes. 
Isn't that true? You with me so far? David also adds something to the psalm and he says, your rod and the staff, they comfort me. What is this rod? The shepherd carries a club-like structure, a, a, a thing, which has nails on the end. This is meant to beat the creatures that try to attack the sheep. It's a, it's a symbol of power. It's a symbol of the, the, the ability of the shepherd to take care of the sheep. It's an absolute authority, authoritative instrument in a shepherd's hand. It's a symbol of protection for the sheep. And next thing is a staff. Staff is a symbol of God's provision, symbol of God's grace. You see there's a hook at the end. When the sheep wander away, he uses a staff to pull it back onto the course. So there is grace and there is protection. Provision and protection both that the shepherd provides when we walk through these dark valleys, my friends. One of the things I realized as soon as I became a Christian is as soon as you become a Christian, it's not a f- you don't soar in the clouds. I never met anybody of that sort yet. Did you? Really? As soon as I became a Christian, I thought I'll be flying all the way to heaven without any difficulties, any problems whatsoever. Then God began to teach me that even though when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will be with you. Your rod and the staff that comfort me. There are valleys that are designed for us, my friends. We are meant to walk through them because we'll understand God for who he is. We'll understand his nature. We'll depend upon him more and more. God is more clearly visible in our struggles than in our victories, believe it or not. He'll show himself strong on our behalf when we go through these tough times. It continues to say, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. God not only takes care of our directional, spiritual, emotional needs, he'll take care of our physical needs. He he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. The table is God's provision. Yes, hard work is a responsibility for every individual. We are not meant to be lazy and sit there and say, oh, God, provide for me. We are meant to work hard. Diligent hands make plenty, says Proverbs. We need to work hard at things. Our education, our knowledge, our jobs, we need to work hard and be an example to glorify God. But never forget, it's God who provides us everything. There's one scripture in the Bible that's my favorite. It says, the lions, the lions grow hungry and they look to the hands of God. The lions grow hungry and look to the hands of God. A lion can get whatever it wants. It's a massive creature. It can use a deer like a toothpick and something else for something else. It's so self-dependent. It can do whatever it wants. But this beautiful scripture says, even when it grows hungry, it looks to the hands of the Lord. What a beautiful picture. How about us? Are we depending on our abilities to say, yeah, I'll provide for my family as long as I'm on this planet. My family is not going to starve because of my capabilities, my intellect, my job, my property, my wealth. If it's my, 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 we are getting it wrong. It is God who provides, and he is the one we need to look to. What does it say? He prepares a table in the presence of my enemies. The shepherd, he spreads his cloak, it seems, and he puts some grain on top of it. And the sheep come and they eat and he's just standing there. From the neighboring hills, these wolves and the hyenas are looking at the sheep, but they cannot attack them because the shepherd is standing there watching over the sheep. The enemies are waiting to attack the sheep, but because the shepherd is here, they can't do anything about it. What are our enemies? Very simple. Anything that threatens the security of an individual is our enemy. It's not an individual, maybe. Maybe an individual, maybe not. It could be the economy. It could be your bank balances. It could be inflation, depression, failing health, recession, bad supervisor. It could be anything. Anything can threaten that security of a believer. My friends, despite economy, despite stocks and jobless rates, despite everything going uh, haywire all around us, things going disastrous, he, our God, can prepare a table in the presence of our enemies. How assuring is that this morning? 
Amen. Thank you. There's one man who can speak that out. I'm so grateful for a God that I don't have to depend on my abilities because I know I'll fail. But praise the Lord. He prepares the table in the presence of my enemies. And then he says, he anoints my head with oil. My cup runs over. The sheep have bruises, scrapes. Then what the shepherd does, he pours some oil and pours it upon their body abundantly. You know what it does? It causes the healing of those wounds. Oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. God has given us the Holy Spirit to dwell with us. When we're going through these tough times which don't make sense, there is this comfort and the counsel that comes from the Holy Spirit. Do we have an understanding of who the Holy Spirit is in our lives? It's not it, it is he, a part of the Trinity. God himself gave us this privilege and access to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. And he soothes our wounds amidst this healing, amidst this pounding of the chest of God. He'll just embrace you and give you his comfort. It doesn't make sense, but still he's there for us. And he says, David says, my cup runneth over, my cup overflows. God is a lavish God. When they multiply those five, uh, five loaves and two fish, they fill the extra baskets. When Peter cast his nets on Jesus' command, the nets were breaking. They called the neighbors to pick up more fish. God gives lavishly. It overflows. And does it end there? No. After meeting our physical needs, he comes to the conclusion here. He says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Look at the first word in this whole verse here. He says, surely, surely, David says. It's not perhaps, possibly, hopefully. These are the terms that we use. Or maybe God will take care of the rest of my days. There's no uncertain terms here. My friends, surely he will take care of all our needs all the days of our life. God has, in fact, given us two stalkers. Once we have this shepherd, goodness and mercy, they keep following us all the days of our life. I love to have these talkers around me all the time, don't you? Goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. The word mercy is a beautiful word in Hebrew called hesed, which means loving kindness. It is rich in Hebrew, which I don't understand the significance of. It's one of the most encouraging words, it seems. And they're meant to follow us, not till 2011 Thanksgiving, all the days of our life. Praise the Lord. And does it end there? No, it doesn't. And it says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Your eternal needs no, don't end when you die. It only begins and continues all the days of your life. When you die, you enter into the presence of God, and that's where you dwell forever. Forever, my friends. Are we trying to make this world our home? Are we trying to make this, there's no other way, I die, I want to acquire, acquire, acquire possessions, latest HD TV, now with 3D, with glasses, no glasses, acquire, acquire, acquire possessions, acquire things, oh, my kids, my grandkids, my, I need a bigger balance. As, are we living as if there's no tomorrow? I mean, we're not home yet. We're not home yet. Bible calls us pilgrims. We're just walking through this earth. It's a matter of time like a vapor. We are gone. And there we are in the presence of God. That's where I want my investment. My friends, are we living like there is no tomorrow? Bible says God will take care of our eternal needs. When you die, it's not a period. It's just a conjunction. And... I will dwell a conjunction. Just it continues forever. So in conclusion, when the sheep comes back to his sheep fold, he brings all the sheep with him, and they all enter through this narrow hole into this stone walled enclosure, and then the shepherd himself lays down in front of that entrance. And while the sheep are entering, he dips this rod that he has in a color, and he marks every tenth sheep, okay, so that he can keep the count. And once they're all in, he lays down right in front of it. This rod has been the origins of the scepter of a king. 
A scepter is a symbol of power, protection, and authority. Jesus Christ said this in John chapter 10. I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Whoever enters through me will be saved. And John 10 verse 11, one of my favorites. I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. We as humans cannot comprehend the deep spiritual concepts and the love of God. In order to explain his love towards us, God used this analogy of the shepherd and the sheep. Hope it makes sense. This good shepherd, my friends, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, the omnipotent, omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful, left his crown of glory to take the crown of thorns. He laid down his life on the cross for your sin and mine so that we will not lack anything, if he becomes our good shepherd, we, we will experience his saving, his protecting, his sanctifying, his guiding relationship because we are dumb, defenseless, directionless, and we are dirty. We need help. We need a shepherd, my friends. And not only does he take care of our needs, he takes care of all our needs. And it says he takes care of our spiritual needs, our directional, our emotional, our physical, and eternal. What else is left? Nothing. It all can happen. It's based on only Psalm 23, verse 1. Only if the Lord is your shepherd. It all can happen only if the Lord is your shepherd, my friends. A little girl was asked in the Sunday school to recite and, recite and quote Psalm 23, verse 1. She said, the Lord is my shepherd, that's all I want. The Lord is my shepherd and that's all I want. Really, that's all you want. Once we have him as a shepherd, everything else will be taken care of. If you're an unbeliever sitting here, do you have him as a shepherd yet? If not, it's time to have this good shepherd who promises to take care of you. He will never abandon you. But if you are a believer, I'll ask you the same question. Is he your shepherd yet? Are we depending upon him the way we should? Are we still trying to do things on our own mind? Are we still sinning by worrying about the future? You decide. The scripture is the ultimate authority right in front of our face. Are we depending on the promises of God enough?